This is a sort of a wild card video uh, that I put together. And it's got a fair number of goodies in there. I mean, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about is kind of basic, but not all of it is. And so stay tuned, if you will. And let's see what we can do about talking to some about just some of the basic principles and some stories that I have and, and that kind of thing. Um, everybody just about that has done much work for a very long has got them a, uh, you know, big uh, boat collection. You know, there's, uh, if you're like me, whenever you are through with a job that required replacement of bolts or when you tore apart an old engine or something like that and you were discarding the various parts of it and you had bolts left or there was some kind of a junk job that was being done and there was bolts left. You hate to throw bolts away because you never know when you might need one. And there's all different varieties of them. This right here is a shoulder bolt. And that bolt there is like, kind of like what you use on seat belts. Whenever you tighten this all the way down, it's still got this exposed and their stuff can swivel around it freely. And uh, you know, those right there, whenever you need one, nothing else will do. And <clears throat> obviously that's a spark plug, duh. Uh, but anyway, some of them have got these big uh, fender top washers. A big washer like that one with a little hole in the middle and a big outside is a fender washer, they call it. Those are extremely useful. Um, and then these little, some of them have got the fender washer built onto it where it won't come off. And then you got these heads, it's got a little washer kind of molded into it. And standard bolts like you buy uh, don't typically have, uh, you know, anything special particularly about them. One of the things that I have noticed, though, is that American type bolts typically, uh, whenever you buy just standard bolts, will have threads for a certain distance, uh, and then they'll stop. Now, sometimes metric bolts are like that. See, this one right here is a metric bolt. Uh, that one right there um, is a uh, half-inch fine thread bolt, and you know, of course, these big nuts. These big nuts that you have that are left over from a CV axle job, you don't want to get rid of those because there's no telling when you might need one. Or if you've got a really good uh, castellated nut, like what came off of a ball joint or something like that, or, or a tie rod end, it's always good to save those. Now, not all tie rod ends and not all ball joints have the same thread, but I have seen it where I would reach in my bucket whenever I was in bad need of a castellated nut for whatever reason, and I would be able to find one in there. Now. These castellated nuts also make a pretty good thread chaser. If you flip them over backwards and screw them on there, you know they'll kind of clean those threads out really neat. Uh, if you you know if you're running into issues putting the nut back on there, um, but you know anybody that's trained younger mechanics knows that uh, you, a younger mechanic can destroy the threads on something to the point that where they, you have to either use a thread file or uh, you know a thread chaser or something to fix them if possible. Because uh, replacing the part sometimes is not a viable option because the parts are so expensive. Now, recognizing different kind of thread is important. The reason, you know, I, I was dealing with a parts house over here, a fairly large uh, parts house, and the manager of the parts house, I told him, I called him on the phone, and I, you ever, if you if you can tell somebody on the phone what you need without them being able to, you know, turn the computer screen around saying, you know, show me, you know, show me a picture of what you need here. You know, some of your parts people need to do that. But I told this guy, I said, you know, I had bought a, a regulator, an air pressure regulator, and it had, uh, or either that or I had found an old one. One way or another, it had uh, three open 1 8 pipe ports in it, and I needed to stop up one of those. And the uh, and so I told him, I said, I need a 1 8 pipe plug. And uh, he says, well, just send me whatever it's you're going to screw into. So I, I said, I don't know why he needed that, but I sent him up there. I mean, you know, a lot of times it'll be in a little uh, pack that says 1 8 NPT, you know, uh, what's he need that for? So I sent it up there, and he sent me back a, uh, a flare nut, you know, like from a brake, brake line, an uh, inverted flare nut, and I said, uh, that's really not what I was after. I always forget whether the inverted flare nut has a thread on the outside or the inside, but I think it's the out. Anyway, the long and the short of it was he had screwed that in there, and he goes, well, that screwed in there and fit, so I figured it must be what you wanted. Well, it's got a big hole in the middle. That's not going to help me. And so uh, basically I sent him, like I had a little box that had had some heat shrink tubing in it, and I had used all the tube in there or whatever, and, and I put a uh, little labels in each one of those things, and I put uh, a little one-eighth, uh, pipe fitting that wasn't a plug but it was you know one eight quarter inch three eighths half inch and I went all the way up so all he had to do was look at those and he could tell the different pipe threads 
and all that. But this pipe thread, you'll usually see some exposed threads even after it's tightened down because it's tapered so it seals. And it's astonishing to me how many people don't understand that, but they work with it every day in the automotive industry. Uh, half inch pipe, three eighths pipe, quarter inch pipe. A lot of these uh, uh, cool, I mean, you know, like, there'll be various different ways that uh, coolant sensors mount, but a lot of the times you'll see one it's mounted with 3 h pipe thread and it'll have this stuff on it and then th this right here will typically be the where your heater hose goes in and this is your, your the ones you're really probably most familiar with is the little nipple that goes on your impact wrench it is quarter inch pipe thread now if you're looking at quarter inch you're talking inside diameter on schedule 80 pipe as i remember is how they do that but the outside of those threads is as big as a 3 h bolt and that confuses people if they don't know how threads work all right. Now, what can we tell about this bolt? <coughs> well, it's a hex cap screw. All right. See that? It's got that number of sides like what you use for a wrench. It's got six radiating lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, like this right here. <coughs> now, who came up with this? I don't know. Somebody else might have done the history on it and been able to tell you. But why in the Sam Hill do they put eight, six lines for grade eight, five, three lines for grade five, and no lines for grade two? That's weird. Also, <clears throat> something I was going to mention, and I'll mention talk a little bit more later. If you see a bolt that is a really good bolt, it will have an identifying stamp on the head so you can tell who made the bolt. For example, Lake Erie will have LE on the, uh, on the head. But if you see a bolt that's just got a triangle on the head, it, it, you're not going to find out who made that bolt. They'll typically be made by some foreign bolt manufacturer. But if you want really good bolts, like, you know, John Deere, uh, have, we'll have JD on the head of theirs, I guess that's what JD stands for, because it seems like I've seen them bolts on John Deere tractor and equipment. But Lake Erie is a really good bolt, and if they put their name on there, and I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. i gotta got to proceed here to get along going. But the higher the number, the finer the thread on one of these bolts. In other words, the higher this number is, the more threads per inch you're going to have. So this is threads per inch, the way it's done. And it's one and a half inches long. So this is what you do. So if you call the parts store and you say, I need a, uh, a grade eight, half inch, I, I, I say fine thread, but 20 threads per inch, one and a half inches long. If you give them that information about the bolt or bolts you're needing, then they, that vectors them down to the point to where they know exactly what to send you. Now, if you're a sort of, sort of a stickler like me, and you're putting some body panels back on, or you're putting some uh, engine stuff back together, and uh, you don't want to just take a bolt that came out of the bolt bin and put it back in there if you're wanting it to look like a factory job. You want exactly the kind of bolt that came in that thing. You know, and like sometimes you can pretty much feel like this bolt right here is going to have a three quarter inch head or a 19 millimeter. You know, which three quarters, 19 millimeters, so close you can interchange the wrenches. So, a lot of times, whenever they specially special build a bolt, they'll actually put a smaller head than what you would usually expect on that size bolt. Uh, like, for example, a lot of your uh, eight millimeter bolts on, a, on the vehicles that we have today, you know, eight millimeter, one and a quarter thread pitch bolts, will basically have a, like a, a, you know, you'd expect that to have a 13 millimeter head unless it's an Asian vehicle and then they'll have a 12 millimeter head or if it's a special bolt that they built you know for whatever reason it'll have a 10 millimeter head with a sort of a washer made onto it and it will have the 8 millimeter uh, bolt size and so if it's got a bunch of 10 millimeter heads with 8 millimeter bolts you know that you're spinning in a little built-in molded washer uh, flat surface <clears throat> you know it's, it's sort of a downer to grab something out of the bolt bin that's got a 13 millimeter head and put it in there with all of those that's got those 10 millimeter. I'm, I'm a stickler for that kind of thing, just, you know, excuse me, but it looks more professional if you put exactly the same kind of bolts that were in there to start with. And when I was at the Ford place, when we were putting those little modules on the side of the distributors, you know, little gray TFI modules, I found out the part number on those little bitty screws, because those things were hard to come by, uh, that would hold that module on the side of the distributor, and I bought a box of those things that I kept in my toolbox. I mean, I kept, them, I kept boxes of little things like that so I could put it back together so it would be just as factory as I could possibly make it. All right, so there's your grade 8. That's what this one here is. All right, what can we tell about this bolt? This is a metric bolt. Now, it's hard to see the numbers on this one because of the way it's photographed. 
But this is an interesting thing that most people don't know. If it says 10.9, obviously the higher the number is, the harder and the stronger the bolt is. This means 1,000 megapascals tensile strength. That means that's what it takes to pull this thing in two and break it. And yield strength is 90%. So in other words, it'll begin to stretch when you get to 90% of that, <coughs> of 1,000 uh, megapascals. The numbers are for hardness. The thread pitch is one and a half millimeter and that's from crest to crest, and it's 38 millimeters long, which is about one and a half inches anyway. The metric thread pitch is reading here, so basically think about the difference between that. If you've got the, the, the smaller the number, in other words 1.5, if it was 2.0, it would, the thread would be coarser. If it was 1.0, the thread would be finer. And so basically the bigger the number on these, the coarser the thread. But it's basically looking at how many millimeters it is from crest to crest. <coughs> All right, pound feet is foot pounds versus pressure. Pound feet is torque, psi is pressure. Now think about this whenever you're just talking about pressure in general. This is like atmospheric pressure. Psi G is a pressure measurement that considers sea level pressure as zero. <coughs> so sea level pressure rounds to about 14.7 psi. PSIA is a measurement of pressure that begins in a perfect vacuum. Thus, the tire pressure of 30 PSIG would be a measure of 44.7 PSIA. This is a little bit of a fast factoid that you can deal with right there. You can screenshot that. And, uh, I built this, by the way, so nobody's got a copyright on it. Newton meters versus megapascal. The Newton meter is torque. Megapascal is pressure. A Newton meter is equal to 0.7376 foot-pounds. Now you'll notice that you'll have, uh, they, all, they don't always say Newton meters, they'll say, if in a lot of these books they'll say you're tightening at so many Newtons, but that's basically what they're talking about there, as per, as per Isaac Newton, I suppose. Megapascal, one megapascal equals 145 PSI, and one billion Newton meters equals a thousand megapascals. That's not terribly hard to, you know, you know I don't know what you're going to do with that information, that's just something that I like to throw around. Uh, but the clamping force of the bolt has got a lot to do with the pressure, the turning force that you're t using to torque. And see, you're multiplying that turning force because you've got an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder here. Tensile strength is when the bolts, you know, this has to do with how much stretching, how much pressure the bolt can take before it starts to stretch. Okay, <clears throat> one time back when I was working down there in the, the uh, offshore services industry, we had a ton and a half Chevy pickup, not a pickup, I'm sorry, ton and a half Chevy truck, work truck, that uh, <laughs> it was really a, a, a grueling job. They says uh, they had this 1500 gallon fuel tank, you know, that's got two separate fuel tank uh, chambers in it. And they said, we want you to mount this on this one and a half uh, ton truck chassis. And we want you to put a power takeoff on the transmission. And we want you to put a hydraulic pump uh, I mean, not a hydraulic pump, I mean a, a fuel pump on there. And we want you to pipe this thing so that they, they, we've sold this truck to this outfit at the airport out there that's going to use it to fuel helicopters. You know, it had really, and, and they had this, all of the hardware that it took, you know, the big hose reel with the huge oversized, you know, gas filler and all that on it. And, they, and you had, I had to uh, thread the pipe and put it all together with the valving and all that kind of stuff. It was a real challenging job. But when I got through, there was a ton and a half truck and it had this big uh, tank on it. And, and they says, uh, we want to make sure it works right. We weren't going to fill, fill the thing up with fuel for them. But anyway, they filled it up with Jet A1 helicopter fuel. And he says, go out to the airport and make sure that thing works right because they filled it up with fuel. And so I said, okay. So I went out there and I opened the little doors on the side of the thing and I zeroed the meter and I set it so that it was pumping it would be pumping out of the same tank that I was going to pump back into. And I dragged the hose out and I got up on top of it. I cranked the engine up. I engaged the PTO and I, you know, set the throttle up to about 1700 RPM. You could hear all that thing going to town. It was, PTO was spinning the pump and it was, you know, trying to pump fuel. And it was bypassing because I had my the lever not open on the thing. So I dragged out and I got up on top of that truck and I opened the tank that I was going to be pumping out of. And I stuck the nozzle in that tank so I'd be pumping out of one tank back into the same tank. I didn't want to run it over and make a mess out there on the runway. So I pulled the trigger on that thing and I held it for 30 seconds and it was, felt like a fire hose. It was about to blow me off the top of that truck. 
Well, I let go. I climbed down off the top of the truck and I looked at the meter because I had zeroed it before I got up there and I pumped 45 gallons of fuel in 30 seconds. <laughs> it's doing pretty good. Well, that was okay, but you know, this was an old truck that we had on hand that we had never had to do a lot of work to. And so we sold it to them and they were driving it. They would get, bring it to the Gulf Oil Refinery to fill it up with the Jet A1 chopper fuel. And then one day when I was going home, I noticed that that truck uh, was being hauled away from where they had been leaving the Gulf Oil Refinery, and it had a, a wrecker pull in it, big wrecker. And I noticed one of the wheels was off of it. And I said, I wonder what the heck that was about, because we never even took a wheel off that thing, and you know, what in the world is it doing there? And as I got a closer look at it, I noticed, you know, when I was driving by, it was moving kind of slow, and it was still on the side of the road waiting to pull out. I noticed that that thing had seized up a wheel bearing. It had drum brakes on the front, because it was that old, and it had seized up a bearing, and it had twisted the end off of that spindle. And when it twisted the end off the spindle and the tire came off, the brake drum uh, had wiped all the brake parts off, slammed up to the backing plate, and had destroyed the backing plate. Anyway, <clears throat> so the, the boss man says, get your truck and get over whatever tools you think you might need and drive over to the airport. It was in like January. It was blowing cold mist everywhere, <laughs> all that. So I went over there and I backed my 74 Ford pickup up there to that truck. And, you know, it was uh, sitting on uh, some blocks. And, and uh, it seemed like I had to get a bottle jack and jack it up a little higher, you know, so I could work on it like I needed to. But uh, anyway, I blocked it up with some wooden blocks under there. And in order to replace that spindle, you have to remove this kingpin. All right, to remove the kingpin, there was a little plate on the top of it with two holes, uh, you know, and it basically had a little uh, wedge that was driven through down here. It had a little notch cut in the kingpin. I should have put a picture of that. And you had to drive that little wedge out, and then you had to knock that kingpin out of there after you drove the little wedge out. And you'd knock it out from the top. And it had a little uh, plate on the top with a grease fitting in it. So I took that plate off and it had two holes and I said, well, I've got a, a dandy little steering wheel puller in here and I had my toolbox, I had my junk drawer and all that and I opened it up and I got a couple of long quarter inch uh, bolts. One of them had the Lake Erie stamp on it. The other one uh, was, they were both grade five bolts, but one of them had the Lake Erie stamp on it. The other one had just the three lines for grade five and a little triangle, which was a Chinese made bolt. I don't know where it was made, whatever. And so I used those two bolts, and that I was going to take that uh, steering wheel puller and mount it on there and press that kingpin out because, you know, hitting it wasn't moving it. And so uh, I started putting pressure on that thing with that, uh, you know, turning that jack screw down to try to push that kingpin out. And I noticed that the Chinese-made bolt or whatever, wherever it came from, stretched and started looking like this, and the Lake Erie bolt held firm. Both of those bolts were grade 5, but just because it says grade 5, if there's no name stamp on the head of that bolt, you may not, unless you got it from Ford or GM or whoever it was that, you know, uh, made it start with, but if you're just using bolts and you don't have a, a stamp on I guarantee you, from what I've experienced in the field working on heavy equipment and stuff, if you've got a name brand bolt that's got the, where you can track the thing back to whoever made it, you know, you're going to have a better bolt than if you've just got a generic stamp of some kind, like a triangle or something like that, or nothing, except for three lines on the top of it. Anyway, in order to get that kingpin out of there, I had to go and get a uh, torch from the hangar over there to heat it up, and I got it out of there. And I got a kingpin kit. I got a spindle. I went around with my purchase order book to Beaumont, Texas, because this was at the airport in Beaumont. I went around there, and I got uh, the kingpin. I got all the brake parts except I couldn't find an adjuster. I got brake shoes and all that. I to put all this back together. I got some grease so I could pack the bearings. I, you know, I had to get the bearing. I had to get the whole thing. I had to build that right front and all that. So I got all that put back together. And put. But I was coming back by Stuart and Stevenson, and I knew we had a Heister forklift that had a great big adjuster on the brakes about the same size as the one on this, that this 71 Chevy truck needed for its brake shoes. And so I just wheeled in there with my purchase order book because we had an account with them. And I bought a brake adjuster for one of those Heister forklifts, and it fit that Chevy perfectly. <laughs> so anyway, I got that, uh, that thing done. But one of the things I'm trying to tell my, uh, my students when I was teaching, <clears throat> you need to be one of these people that's like a Hellfire missile on an Apache helicopter, and fire and forget. And what that means is you don't get fired from your job. They send you to do something, and they don't even have to look and see if it's going to get done. 
if they send you to do something and you get it, that you're the person that gets things done, that they don't have to follow up and look behind you and make sure you did everything right. They're going to know you did it right if you're the kind of character you need to be. And uh, that's something I was also teaching them. Even when you're putting the parts back on the inside of a door where you don't think anybody's ever going to look, you need to put every bolt right. You need to put every rivet back in place. You need to put every, you know, put the wire a little, you know, uh, you know, resecure the wire harnesses under the hood when you're done and all that. It needs to look just like factory when you're done if there's any possible way. And that's just part of the deal whenever you want to be one of those people that they can send and depend on. Working thread, in other words, these are threads that are made to do a lot of hard work, like on this vise and like on this uh, ball joint tool, that C-press. Um, that thing right there is going to have threads like this, uh, basically. Now, I'll tell you something, if you're using a power steering pump pulley puller, or if you're using one of these, if you'll put some grease on those threads, or even some really good motor oil, grease is what I like better than anything else because motor oil tends to drip and dry off, but you put some grease on them threads, you're going to exponentially increase your ability to torque, you know, to, to move things. I've seen these students get out there with a dry uh, power steering pump pulley puller, and that thing would just absolutely weld it, the, the jack screw uh, into the other part of it so that it was never usable again. And so uh, putting some grease on it is going to make a tremendous amount of difference on it whether you're able to complete that job a lot if you got something that's really hard to move. So we always put grease on this every time we used it. Uh, and then you got your buttress thread, acme thread, square thread, so on and so forth. Acme thread is what the coyote uses when he's going after the road runner. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, 3 8 bolt torque to 35 foot pounds produces just under a 30,000 psi of clamping pressure. That's your mega pascals, except it's in you know psi. Lubricate the threads, and that same bolt with the same 35 foot pounds torque produces nearly 40,000 psi. I saw this demonstrated. Um, this uh, tool that had a little hydraulic chamber and a gauge measuring the pressure in there. Uh, and this guy would put a bolt through there and torque it, and it would actually squeeze in that hydraulic fluid and, and give you the pressure on the gauge. And he basically got a bolt, uh, you know, a 3 8 bolt and a nut and a washer on both sides, and he just torqued it to, you know, 35 foot pounds, and that gauge went up to like, you know, something like 28,000 psi. And then he took a brand new bolt, took it out of there, the gauge went back to zero, he took a brand new bolt, uh, put the same washers and all that kind of stuff on it, just like he did. But he put grease on the threads. And whenever he put 35 foot pounds of torque on it, the clamping pressure increased exponentially, like from 28,000 to 40,000 psi. I watched this happen when I was at <coughs> KC Vision uh, one year, and I was, went and attended a course called Students Break Things. <laughs> but anyway, it was a really good demonstration that I thought, and that's one of the reasons that I like to put just a little dab of grease on the threads for uh, lug nuts. Because uh, you're going to get more clamping force on the lug nut you know, without damaging anything, if you put a little dab of grease on those threads. If you, the same amount of torque, you're going to get more clamping force. That's just all there is to it. Now, if you're putting head bolts in there, obviously you don't need to put a lot of oil on those. You know, if you don't, you know, I've talked before about if there's oil or coolant in the bottom of a head bolt hole, it's going to stop as soon as it hits it because that fluid can't come past those threads and you're going to have a hydraulic lock and you can bust the block that way. So make darn sure you blow out all the head bolt holes or if you've got a hole that's going down into a you know blind is if it's got a hole with the bottom blow that thing out clear it out if possible you know chase the threads before you do it maybe put a little dab of uh, of some kind of grease on there and, and, and screw it in there and do your clamping and everything but don't try to do that down in the diesel shop there was a great big trainer engine it was a vt906 cummins or something i don't know what it was and those students had hydraulic locked a bolt in a hole and the bolt went tight and now they just got a bigger and bigger and bigger pipes and all that and they busted the block on that trainer engine because they didn't understand hydraulic lock and the instructor hadn't thought to mention it to them. <clears throat> Minimum oil pressure on an engine for lubrication, 10 PSI per thousand RPM, but if you got time and chain tensioners that are oil pressure driven, you're going to have to have 28 PSI at idle. If you've got less than 25 on a 5.4 liter, you're going to have a racket. And that, that tensioner is not going to put out enough uh, ten, you know, to hold that timing chain and you're going to have rattling and, and, and all kinds of problems in there. And that's another story about what causes that. High voltage systems are not grounded to the vehicle chassis. In other words, that big battery 
It is not grounded to the vehicle chassis anywhere. Just remember that. That's just a little quickie. I'm just throwing you that little thing up there <clears throat> where this is an inverter. Every uh, motor has got an inverter uh, because you're taking DC current out of this battery and you're running it through this to turn it into AC current to operate those motors, those three-phase motors and all that. High voltage control unit is a little uh, battery, I mean little controller that comes with this uh, high voltage battery typically. This is a sort of a generic thing. There's different systems out there now. But, uh, there's what a leaking water pump looks like. <clears throat> Whenever you see that, you know the water pump's been leaking because the weep hole is right there, you know, and it comes out of there. You know, I think I told you about this guy that sent me an email one time from South Africa. And he, he, he even typed in a British accent I was talking about. And he said he had a leaking water pump on his Mercedes and he couldn't, couldn't afford a kit to rebuild the water pump. He couldn't afford a water pump. And he was wanting to know if I had some kind of a quick fix. As I said, if the bearings weren't loose, flopping around, he just had a leak coming out the weep hole. And I told him to pour a little brake fluid in the radiator and watch it, and it would stop leaking while it was running. And so he did that. And then, of course, I told him, I said, after it stops leaking, you stop that engine, drain the cooling system, put fresh coolant and stuff back in there, and you'll get by like that for a while. That's a filling station trick I learned back in the 70s when I was working at that little gas station. All right, now this right here was why the van was overheating. You might notice that this guy right here had worked on his van. He's trying to figure out why it was overheating and all, and he couldn't figure it out. And basically what we did was we pulled the heater hoses loose, and we took the, a piece of clear hose, and we put it from one heater hose to the other, and we fired it up, and we didn't see any coolant going through that heater hose business. And so I said, something's going on with a water pump. This one here didn't have a, a metal impeller with a cavitated surface. It basically had an impeller where it, this had come loose from the shaft and it was just spinning. And uh, that was one of those things that uh, it made a really good video uh, to show, you know, because that ought to be spinning with that. It's supposed to be all one piece. And so we popped another water pump on that one. It's pretty, you notice reaction surface on this one is actually in the Simon cover. That was from a Dodge Caravan, by the way. All right, now this one right here is a blown head gasket thing. You spin it over and you see puff, 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 puff. Every time one of the cylinders comes up, it's got the blown gasket. It's puffing that out of there. I've got another video on here about checking a blown head gasket. It's only like a one minute video. But what you do is, if you're wanting to see which cylinder is doing this, you, uh, uh, and if it's just blowing a little bit, <clears throat> you fill the cooling system completely up with water. Take the, uh, you know, I like to take the thermostat out, but you don't necessarily have to. And pull all the plugs but one. Put num number one plug in there, spin it over. And whenever the uh, number one plug is, we spin it over, if it disturbs the water in the radiator, you know, whichever cylinder disturbs the water in the radiator, with all the plugs removed except one, then you move that to the next hole, the next hole. Every time you spin it over, you're going to watch that water in the radiator. If you see the water in the radiator bouncing with compression strokes, you know that's the cylinder where the blown head gasket is. And uh, so, anyway, testing a four liter Jeep for coil, you know those coil rails right there. Now, if you're thinking about this, you might think, well, apparently this coil fires these two plugs, this coil fires those two, and this coil fires those two. Well, that's hogwash, and it can't be that way, because this thing right here, you got, what's the firing order? 1, 5, 3, 6, 2, 4, right? All right, 1, 5, 3, 6, 2, 4. So, 1 and 6 are companions. All right, 2 and 5, 3 and 4. So your companions are 1 and 6, 2 and 5, 3 and 4. Each one of these is going to fire a pair of companion cylinders. So that means there's some rails built into this going down through here. Furthermore, not all of these coil rails are the same. We actually had a salvage yard engine one time that we put in, that, and it had a coil rail on it, and it was kicking back like it had cross plug wires or something. And in order to make that thing start and run, we had to take the coil rail off of the original engine that had been in the vehicle and put it on the engine that we got from the salvage yard. So not all of these are alike. Make darn sure you're using the right one or you will throw yourself for a loop. Anyway, I was testing. I kept getting primary faults for this uh, on this Jeep that I was working on. I talked about it one time before. And I took a Ford coil and I basically uh, built an adapter to plug into the harness. You might notice that the harness on this one plugs in way back here. Well, I plugged that harness, uh, you know, I built me a little harness there, you know, and I just tied these together. This was a temporary deal, let's see. They actually have 
some people are putting coils similar to this on there that are really sexy looking and they put plug wires on there but you got to know you got three coils you know coils right here and you got to know in what order to wire them up and which plugs they're going to go to because each one of these is going to a different pair of companions well I fired that one up and I drove it with this on there and the same problem because I had it plugged in you know where the coil rail plugged in the same problem the original coil rail was given happened with this one so that told me it wasn't a problem with the coil rail and I wound up finding something else wrong with it I talked about it another time the cam, the cam synchronizer was out of adjustment and this thing would drop cylinder it would drop companion cylinders it would drop you know either one in six or two and five or three and four every time and it was always throwing coil faults primary coil faults but it turned out that the only thing it took to fix that was adjusting the cam uh, synchronizer like it was supposed to be anyway this right here is a fairly common AC leak you're going to see on you know 2000 X6 series 4 that XX because it can be you know many several year models but that little I, I saw that on more than one of them you'd see a put some dye in there and fire up your little and you'd see a little bit of bubbles right here and you know it, that's a little that's it doesn't take very much of a refrigerant leak to get rid of of refrigerant and warm and make it have more warm air again within just a couple of days a very very small leak like that uh, will, will cause you to uh, have that kind of issue this is something that was spotted during oil change that's one of those things that you're just kind of glad you saw and then and it, that is a legitimate reason to sell a customer some more work and you can walk him out of the vehicle and say look this is not supposed to be doing this you know uh, in that particular case if I remember right this way bar uh, the bushings had come loose and it popped over there and it was against that or whatever um, this right here is a variable geometry turbocharger and a cutaway and you can kind of get an idea of how that works see those veins now the ones that the the the, P, the power stroke diesel and the duramax both use a very similar uh, See, whenever the veins are closed, it acts like a small turbocharger. When they're wide open, it acts like a bigger one. That works pretty smooth. That one, right, that particular one right there was uh, uh, at, a, at a power stroke rally when I was up there. It was a cutaway, and I took a little video of it. And uh, This right here, the, this girl on this car was feeling the engine vibrating whenever she was sitting there. And so we did some investigation on that and found this rock that was crammed in that mount. And when we knock that rock out of that engine now a lot of times you just got to replace the engine mounts because they're soft and, weak and squishy but uh, that was uh, we knocked that rock out of there and that took care of her vibration there was a Chevrolet pickup truck uh, that I uh, was working on that you would swear you know, I was at the Ford place and they brought this little S10 in there there was a V6 in it and I, you would absolutely swear that thing had an engine skip I mean it was but it, it just felt like an engine skip but I walk back there in the back, I put my hand by the tailpipe, it was if it's got an engine skip, it's gonna go bup, 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 bup. you know how that is. So I says, why does this thing feel like it's got an engine skip, but I know it's not skipping. So I, I called my buddy at the uh, big Chevrolet dealer across town and I asked him about it. I said, I got S10 in here, it feels like an engine skip, but it ain't skipping. And he says, you'll never fix that. I said, what? He says, yeah, they, a lot of those S10s do that in that year model. I think it was the early 90s one or whatever. They had a little 4.3 in there. And uh, he says, uh, the only thing you can do that will help that a little bit is put a Caprice transmission mount on it. And that will help a little bit. <clears throat> and so I said, well, I'll be doggone. You know, I mean, you could have just worked and worked and worked on that thing trying to fix an engine ship that wasn't there. Uh, but, you know, mounts and stuff. And a lot of times when I was uh, teaching these guys about how to find this, these uh, engine vibrations and stuff, you can actually take both motor mounts and just loosen them up and loosen up your exhaust joints and all that. Just loosen them so they can move freely. And then you get in the vehicle and you rock it back and forth between drive and reverse, sitting still, let the engine wiggle around and let everything go to where it wants to be. And then you, after you've done that, you very carefully and evenly retighten all the bolts and a lot of times you'll get rid of something like uh, you know vibration or something like that uh, and I used to uh, have students in the classroom you know you always have some guys wearing baseball caps and so I'd say I wanna, I'm going to show you something right here and I'd go over here and I'd pull one of his baseball cap off and I'd put it back on his head exactly the same way it was 
and invariably he'd sit there for just a minute and he'd have to fix his cap so it felt right to him and I said let me see that again and so I pull it off and I put it back on it looked exactly the same but this guy he'd have to pull his cap off and put it back on so it felt right to him that these uh, exhaust and motor mounts and stuff they're like that a lot of the time now the coolest thing about that is it's a little bit of trouble to do but what does it cost a lot of the times you may fix one that you could you know spend all kinds of time putting parts on now if you've got motor mounts that are all packed full of dirt and all that and have a bunch of rocks in them like this you know that needs to be washed out of there and cleaned out of there before you do anything else but if the motor mount gets soft and rubbery and mushy because it's had oil leaking on it you're liable to have you know something like that too um, there was a Mercedes we put some mounts on because of the fluid mounts and it had collapsed and it was shaking and all that kind of stuff now this one here had various different electrical issues I remember this one F-150 you can see where that harness had been chafing against that AC line and it had rubbed in there and it could be any of the wires you know I mean it's all kinds of electrical problems and warning lights and crazy things and engine skips and all that uh, and that thing had been rubbing against there so we pull it back away from there you see that thing had actually eaten into the harness and it made a mess out of it but that was on F-150 as I remember Measuring the ride height all four corners, you start from the bottom of the wheel and you go to the fender. That's the accurate. Don't go from the ground, don't go from the top of the wheel. Uh, the best way to get a long, good, nice long is go from there to there on some of the old uh, Mark 8 Lincolns. We used to have to measure all four of those and put the numbers in the machine and then it would adjust the ride height automatically. You could put the wrong numbers in there and it'd jack the car up to it. Kind of crazy stuff. But if you're checking for ride height, that's a smart way to do it because that's a sort of a a good solid measurement of how it is when it's sitting on the floor and that is the end of the video I really appreciate you guys tuning in and I hope that you got some goodies out of this and I will speak I didn't put my coffee pot up here did I that's really something uh, oh there it is hot dog all right we'll talk to you guys later and I hope you enjoy a nice cup of coffee today